for this uh, whole thing to that. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, architecture, so if uh, you came to see code, then it's going to be really boring for you. Uh, I don't mind if we have time at the end, I'm, I don't mind firing up Visual Studio and showing you a little bit of how this code actually looks like, uh, but I'm not sure it's going to satisfy your, your uh, hunger for real code dem demos and stuff. Um, the, the title of the, of the talk, first of all, this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so I apologize sincerely on how bad it's going to go, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm trying. The, the title of the talk is, is trying to talk about two concepts. One is how we decompose our domain, and the other one, why is it a problem, uh, why update user is a problem. Does anybody think update user is a great method? What? No, no one. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so I, 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 my cut, my work cut out, right? Like a crude update. So yeah, sure? yeah, the kind of crude updates. Yeah. We all, at least the older one among us that built monoliths for a living for a long, long time. That's what we we learned, right? We build crude, and then the crude operations are like you know, create, update, insert, delete, and uh, this crude operation is a generic. A well undefined method that does everything, right? And it does everything initially, it's really clean and nice because it's, you know, we, we don't have a lot of use cases in our business. But later, when things get really, really interesting and the code is v2 and v3 and v4, that becomes like a one monster of a method that has so many, you know, hundreds of code paths, loads of if else's. Yeah, now the drill. Been there? Done yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. So the update user means nothing to me. Is this thing that, that I'm trying to say is like, what are you trying to do? This update user thing is has no meaning and we are allowing this to build a big ball of money. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm hoping that in the context of uh, and decomposing your uh, monolith, I, I hope that that makes sense. Yeah? So. What, how do we logically uh, take a domain and instead of building it as a monolith all bound, bound together and end up with a big ball of mud, we go the kind of microservice-y, service-oriented architecture way where we are uh, building smaller bits and uh, making all that work together, okay? So that's the, the concept. So when we, buy, when we build a, a traditional monolith, the traditional design pattern is that we look at the domain, we ask the business owners, the business the, um, the business experts, what's going on? They say, oh, we want we have a user and we have an account and we have the bank accounts and we have you know whatever shop products and we have uh, prices and all that and you figure out all those things and you build a beautiful data model, right? That you know, we have the you know every table has all its uh, all its um, properties, and those properties belong in that entity. Yeah, that user, that entity has an identifier, and everything inside it is our fields. That's our data, and we add all them together, and we start kind of to create all the relationships between them. Right. So if I create an order, I need to create an order line. I need to add a product to it, I need to make sure I have the price, and so on and so forth, yeah? Mm. Kind of single, uh, and we basically build something like that, right? Now this is a simplified thing that I put together in two minutes, so uh, ignore all the, the SQL mistakes and all the, why are you calling this, yeah, that, but basically, you know, we have like a user, we have a customer, we have an account, then we have orders, we have line items for the prod, and that goes to the product. Uh, we have a payment for this order, right? And then we have the order status and update status and so on and so on, yeah? Questions about that? Anything that uh, anybody want to say that that's not what we used to do at least? Is what that were, all right? What were we thinking? What were we thinking? <laughs> the problem, the main problem here is those, these little relationships, yeah? They introduce coupling, and they they then bring us to the 
to what happens after we add the layers on top, right? We start, we put the data layer on top of that, right? We need the crude operations. We need, of course, some kind of framework because doing SQL on such a large uh, dependency graph is really, really hard. And if you want to read and write and update and do uh, ACID updates, yeah? You want to do like the get a, get a data set. Remember data sets? <laughs> get the data sets. And uh, you know, create an update and make sure that that update is is the right version of the data. Yeah, sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. So these these things are uh, where we start introducing the complexity. On top of that, we build the business logic, right? And now the business logic has to be is another layer of of problems. Yeah. So we hide away all the data problems. And now we put this business logic. Now the business logic has to get some data, do something store some data, read some data, do that all over again and again and again. And as the data, the business logic grows, we end up with more and more stuff in our code that try to, that look clean, but are very, very, very heavy. And then we add the UI on top of it, which is the final uh, nail in the coffin, right? The, the UI wants to do totally different things to what your, your data model wants to do and what your business logic wants to do. We squeeze it in, and don't forget the kitchen sink, right? <laughs> we now introduce all the lovely frameworks and this UI that has this, all these amazing behaviors, and, but it needs to do all kind of funky stuff. So, you know, we, we, then it becomes this something like that. Um, big, hefty ball of mud where the fancy graph looks really, really uncomprehensible. And this is like, you know, this is like a large view, yeah? Even if you try to tangle, start to find the, 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 the hook point, it's almost impossible. Um, so we want to move away from that. And we've done in the last, I guess, 10, 10, 5, 10 years, the SOA started it. So our architecture was the first movement that started saying, listen, this is not, this is not going to work. <clears throat> there were, the, the main reason for service around architecture was scale. It wasn't just the monolith was was exceeding the the how much you can scale up your machines and your networks and disks and all that. Yeah. Um, and now we have this microservices thing, which is the service around architecture 2.0 or uh, whatever. Let's not get into that. <laughs> but those two, so SOA and um, uh, microservices, are using the same kind of methodology at the, at the, bo at, at the bottom, you know, at, at behind everything, the same kind of methodology of analyzing the domain. What we're trying to do is to take this big monolith and build something more, more modular, more isolated, more encapsulated, and reduce the coupling between the different moving parts. Is that roughly what we're doing? Yeah, we're happy with that definition. And um, that concept started, again, many years ago. It's not new. And it was introduced by Eric Evans called domain-driven design. I'm going to borrow that bit, at, at least the second half of the book, yeah? The, book, the, 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 the stuff that uh, talks about uh, domain bounded context and domain-driven design, how you and build those bounded contexts and how you make the, the separation or the isolation of... Uh, uh, and we start with context. So just a dictionary definition for now. So context is what we have all around, around something that gives us an, a better understanding of what the thing is, okay? So if I just tell you, if I just say, um, give me an Irish term. Something crack. Crack. <laughs> Excellent. Crack here means oh that's a lot of fun. Da, 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 da. Lots of you know, we're having a good time. In the States it means crack. Also having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's having a good time. <laughs> Without context, we don't we could uh, understand the meaning of something to be very different. Another example would be a user account, right? A user account could be a bank account, could be a checking account, a saving account, and a login account, a 
some account, whatever account means, if we don't put context around it, we lose the meaning of what we're actually going to do with this thing. And different people might use those different things differently. For example, if you're building two teams are building a system, and both of them are uh, looking at this uh, account component, um, and one wants to use it as a commercial account, and the other one wants to use it as a as a user account, as a, you know, like the same thing, it's still, you know, you can see that it talks about money and it talks about, but the commercial behavior is different to the uh, a private account or personal account. And they're trying to, both are trying to develop this component that they share in order to uh, make it work the way they want it. So do you think it will work? Possibly not. So again, context gives you this thing that says this, this is the information that I need in order to do the job, understand what needs to be done. Boundary is, is the thing that stops us from killing ourselves, right? We have a boundary on the road, we have a boundary, you know, we have a window here that if we would ignore, we're just gonna fall two, two floors down, maybe it's not too bad here. Uh, <clears throat> it's, the, it's the thing that we, that, that we can define and say this belongs to me beyond the, beyond the method we have to kind of comply with a couple of things one is the update user thing goes out the window yeah because if we're not explicit about what we want to do and we don't have enough context so we don't say you know update user phone number or update customer account personal account details or a create user address, then we're not gonna we're not gonna get there, yeah, right? Because update user can do 500 things depending on how, how much data you put in and how much business rules we run on top of it and how many scenarios, how many things, how many matrices in the matrix, how many how many things are gonna make a different decision, okay? Uh, 50 things, sorry, 500 is too much. <laughs> uh, tend to, to get carried away. Um, so explicit, explicitness is the first step of understanding. Again, in the domain, when you look at the domain, or when you look at the existing domain, a new domain or existing domain, you have to find this, this explicitness, this context that says, this is what I'm trying to do. And we all agree, this is what he's talking about, the ubiquitous language. We all agree that uh, in the context of the system, a user a personal account means a, an account for a user that is a, a uses the, as opposed to a business user, it's a personal user. So the current account is a term in banking. Current account could be for a business user and current account could be for a private user, right? So a saving account, the same thing, investment accounts and so on. So we all agree that this is what we want to do. And then we go and say, but what do we actually want to do? And we define it as this explicit meaning. It has, you know, it's this action that we're going to do, and whatever is underneath is going to do exactly what we say in the title, yeah? Exactly what it says on the tin. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> once we get those functions or those bounded contexts, we can then easily put the boundaries around them. Because first of all, we have the boundary of the bounded context. We say, this thing, you know, the user email and password or user, uh, the username and password have to be done at the same time and it's one table and all the business logic around it is going to be in that component, in that uh, create user account component. I can, of course I can drag the kitchen sink in, yeah, I could say, oh, but what about address and what about phone number and what about these m m materials? his wedded status, what about his, uh, is he active or not, is he, you know, what about all these other things? And we, and of course we can drag everything in, but if we use the, the kind of, the reduce, kind of map and reduce kind of idea, yeah, where we just go, okay, is that as little as we can go? No, we can go smaller and smaller, and we get to this point where we say, we can't reduce anymore, yeah? We, we are, this is what we need in order to make this thing work. And the second level, or the second, uh, it's actually part of it is the boundaries. Once we have 
all these little boundaries, all these bounded contexts, we can now say that everything that has to do with the user is in the blue service. And everything that has to do with the finance is in the red service. Now, on the technical terms, you can argue that the boundaries should also be kept in code. But I would argue that that's not a, that's not a must. Yeah. So, technically speaking, if I have a user and I have some function that does something in the UI and something in a web service and something in, you know, a, a Windows service, those three pieces of code could could belong in, t you know, in three different solutions that do three different things. But logically, they're all the same thing. Okay, so whenever I ask myself, where does it belong, I say in the blue service. Later you say, oh, the blue service is actually finance. But don't, I think, I'd, I'd, I'd argue that if you don't determine the name of the service early, you get better, you know, you get better at, at putting things together without you know, kind of associating them with like, oh, this has to be finance, because it's finance. But it might be that, uh, but it, again, it, it is very, very hard to do it anyway, so give yourself a break and call the blue service, the yellow service, this, you know, all these things belong together, and they live happily together, and they're uh, very happy. Encapsulation will, is, is again the same, you know, if I have the bounded context, then I can say for sure, that this piece of this piece of work or this unit of work or this component is going to do what it says on the tin. I don't need to know what it does inside. <clears throat> I actually don't want to know what it does inside because that would you know that would cause leakage, right? If I need to know what happens inside that that component for it to do its work, it means that I need to start engaging with this component, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. If I need to ask that component, hey, uh, can you accept this user? And I get a reply, and then I submit the user. What did I do? You ask the service how it behaves internally. Yeah, and I, and I rely on on its behavior in order to to tell me what to do. And I just created this logical coupling that is never going to go away. Yeah. <coughs> Although it's not physically coupled, it is still. I'm I'm now dependent on this other thing to reply. Otherwise, I can't do what I want. So I need to know where it is, I need to know what its API looks like, or what kind of messages does it accept, and I need to wait for a reply. Logically, I have to have that reply stored or something, do something with it, manage the state, and I'm, I'm basically I'm done. So if that's, that's what we see, it means that we need to go back to the boundaries and probably put those things together, or part of them, those things together. Does that make sense? Yeah. So encapsulation, and cohesion, I guess, those two nice words are, uh, you know, will, will give you that really solid bounded context where, you know, all the things that's inside will work, do what they say on the tin, and you don't need to worry about leakages and, and, um, and expansions of your code and business logic to the wrong, to the wrong uh, area. Um, <clears throat> so let's walk through a very, very very optimistic and uh, naive example, and uh, just take it as a as a small exercise. Okay, we have this uh, coming back to what we saw earlier. Uh, we have this lovely uh, uh, table structure, and let's look at each function and what 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 we have there. So the 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 requirement is to create a user login. Okay, so. The simple thing that we need here is the email and the password because without one without the other will make no sense. There's nothing, there's no, you know, we need to capture those two, we need to make, verify those two and, and so on. We also may have an account verification process. How would you describe that in business logic? In data, from a data structure point of view. Uh, verification process, I mean not validation, I mean uh, verification. So I, I send you an email and you reply back to the email and now I know that you actually got my email. Uh, it's it's an RPC call. Hmm? RPC call. Yeah, you could do an RPC call, right? A, a, rem a, a remote procedure call. But is it, is it like, is it something we can model as an entity? 
can, can we do it in one bounded context? Well, you could have an email account verification service. Okay, you're getting there. What I'm trying to say is that there's a process. Okay? And that's where things get interesting because if we try to put processes into our, into our um, kind of bounded context, we're going to make them very big, right? Evans describes it differently, but I, I, I don't want to kind of compare Evans and, and this, but there is like a parallel in Evans' definition, and that's kind of the service boundary, yeah? So these are things, that are service processes or service pol policies, these are things that lie just above the, the, the bounded context, and they orchestrate or choreograph the, those processes, okay? And if we try and put those processes inside our bounded context, we're going to reintroduce coupling and reintroduce dependencies that are almost, there is almost no way to solve, yeah? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in object-oriented programming, that was totally valid, yeah? We added inside the, the create user uh, login, a call to a validate user email, right? We did, let's say, that we could call a web service to validate the user email. We completed that those were two separate encapsulated objects. They had, uh, but they had very tight coupling, right? But if we do that in a distributed, uh, in a distributed thing, we have to put them together, right? They have to be together in the same thread, in the same, okay? Yep. Are we okay with the process thing? Yeah. Hmm. <coughs> and and then and then we can ask the question is then the next question is where does access control belong? On the service. Possibly, but access control, where, where do we do access control? Where does it happen? In the, in, you know. it's, it's a cross-cutting concern, it happens everywhere. It's a cro exactly, so it, it couldn't be in the login thing, bounded context, right? It does kind of, it might be close to it, it might be in its service, yeah? But it's definitely a different concern, a different process, it's you know, go and create the, the authorization for this user, what he's allowed to do, what he's not allowed to do, maybe AD, you know, submitting stuff into AD or whatever, depends on your context, yeah? So, that's cool. So, in this uh, create user component, I only have two fields, right? Maybe three. We agree on that? So I have a component, I have like this, this thing that has uh, an entry method called uh, create user login, very explicit, and it could be even longer. It could be like create personal user login or create uh, shopping cart login or create whatever. Okay, but it's not create user. Yeah, it's create user login, and it does two things in one bounded in one transaction. Actually, in this scenario, and it takes username, email. It takes the username, the email, and the password. So now this long table that we had, the user, you remember? Not in my example, but what you have in your systems or had in monolith systems, that's now been broken. Now, now we just cut two fields out of it, put it somewhere. OK? So let's look at the customer account. We want to create a customer account, right? which is not the login, this is now the account. This is where I put the, you know, I relate to this user and say what is, what happened in this account. This account might have multiple users, it might be a company account, you know, so it depends again in context. Um, so I want to, the only thing I want here in the account is the user authentication ID, right? So I want some reference, yeah? This is not a foreign key, it's a logical foreign key, yeah? And I'll show you later in the, the actual tables. Do we need the first, place and, uh, first name and last name in the account? To, to, to create it, okay? Just no. remember, yeah? Create. We're creating, we're not reading and all that. Leave that for later. This is all about the state changing operations, okay? No, you can create it with just the user authentication ID. And you can, right. and you can have entirely separate operations or actions later on to update those together or individually. Yeah. Anybody disagree? Challenge me, come on. <laughs> it's boring. 
<laughs> the important thing is that we want to make the account maybe this not active until we finish doing other things, right? So the account active is really important for us. So now I reduce the account, which usually looks like a, I don't know, 20 fields uh, in an entity with one sig single, single ID into two fields. Okay? Again, this is, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm going really light on the details here, okay? <laughs> but it's to, to make the, the point. So now we, we look at create uh, contact details, right? It's something that we need to do once we add a user, he puts in his address, his you know, phone number, or emails, and so on. And contact, now we becomes, now we have a little bit of it more interest and things are be, be, becoming just a little bit less clear, yeah? We have the contact email. Are we gonna use the login email? I don't know. Yeah, maybe better not, because that, that would create a really tight coupling between the login and the, and the communication with the customer, right? What if he changes his, he wants five emails to be, you know, whatever. So, and contact phone number, that could be optional, right? Because some, some, uh, some business requirements don't require a phone number. Um, home address. Would we keep the home address here? No, should be the could be a different component or could be the same. It's like, again, and you know, refactoring is still an option. And you'll never get it right the first time. So uh, obviously, in a real example, that would be a lot harder to kind of figure out which, what, whatever. And <clears throat> again, I'm, I'm, I've pointed out that we have this email validation process, right? If you accept this address, this contact email as a validation email, right? We will have to probably do this email validation just to make sure that he actually has access to this email and we're okay to contact him and maybe there could be many many more things like that the processes that are around him accepting terms and conditions and are all kind of things like that make sense uh, can you pause for a second in there yeah so are, you, are you actually seeing that each of these are individual units of work possible individual units of work. Absolutely. Then I'm going to throw in a question from, from real life, and it doesn't need to be answered now. Maybe you have the answer at the end of the deck or something okay. further down the line, right? So if you, if you could go a little bit back to the, to the other side, like, I would assume that each of the individual elements yeah. would be a different call to a different unit of work, and somebody will need to make that call. Yeah. The email validation process is a, if you're looking at the traditional style of, of having a UI updating in sequence or not in sequence all these elements, and then the UI calling the email validation process or one of your other units of work triggering the email validation process, then the email validation process would be a call to a call. So it would be absolutely. It would be a, yeah. would be a very, let's call it a long running process. Long yeah. run, longer. Yeah, long running process. So, at the end of the day, it's one of my personal interests. If you could go ahead and, and answer who's orchestrating everything. So it, it, it's that not is a, a particular question for this. Yeah, moment, yeah. But just so I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later in the when we compose everything into the UI and all that. Then then things become really interesting because it becomes a big mess, right? Yeah. And things like that come into question. Like what do we do and where do we start and so on. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in this scenario, by the way, um, that would probably be an event that would or a command that would be raised from that bounded context. Yeah. So I created the user contact details, and as as a reply, as a response to that, I will send a message or I will publish an event saying, "Hey, I need email validation for this contact." Okay, and in this event, I put the contact ID, the customer ID, yeah, uh, or the address ID or whatever it is. Again, obviously that could be five different components, and that that would work asynchronous in the background. What, what would it do? It will send an email to yourself, you will click a link, you will go to the link on the UI, the UI will send a message back to that component, the component will register that you had a, 
uh, that you had validated your email and will publish an event and now this component or a friend of his, this component, so in the same kind of largely bound, called the same boundary, will uh, uh, add that this validation was done. Okay, it's a long running process but it's orchestrated and, and this is something that we'll talk more about when we talk about processes, okay? But uh, good point. So, <clears throat> and it goes on and on, okay? So we do the same with payment details and when we start with payment methods and uh, how do we add payment methods and how do we validate them and do we, uh, do we add addresses to those payment methods and shipping is, you know, and shall I go on? It's like all these little things that we need to build and build and build. And again, we look, every, every time we start thinking that we have this bounded context perfect, we realize we have a process in place, right? So the process thing is going to nag us and continue along the way. This is something basic that we have to have. Otherwise, those beautiful, uh, isolated, uh, well-defined, uh, bounded contexts are not going to work. And, as Eric Evans said, it's not going to be perfect, yeah? So just don't, you know, give yourself a break. Yeah? Is that a deliberate typo? No. <laughs> oh, it's not going to perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not going to perfect either. <laughs> Thank you. I'll fix it. <laughs> no, it's not. Keep it. Yeah. So, <laughs> did anyone notice? <laughs> I'm not that. Um, so, it's not going to be perfect and it's not going to be perfect because it's, uh, these things are uh, trial and error again and again and again. And it will never be perfect because unless you finish the project, has anybody here si finished the system any time lately? <laughs> Hopefully not, because that means you are fired, right? <laughs> uh, business just, yeah. So this is going to change all the time, and it's really, really hard. So just accept it, that it's imperfect, and, and try and keep those things, you know, just refactor and make it better all the time. Is, is, is this the, 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 main, the main criteria, though? Like, what, what was, the, what's the smallest uh, unit of work? Uh, do, 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 not, do not uh, c c consider, uh, 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 because if you, if you keep going and if you have like a, 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 a very small s s system with uh, 50 tables and you, you, you keep uh, uh, t t throwing three, three or four fields uh, here, here, here and there, yeah. it's going to be a goddamn explosion at, at the end. Uh, very, do, very good. Do you, do you not c consider uh, what gets maintained by which team, potentially a couple of those user, user uh, concerns are in this room only and uh, what, uh, what, what, what's the next slide? <laughs> what needs to be deployed together? And Absolutely. Oh. So, this is like the next slide or a couple of slides later. Okay. Uh, the question was, do, do we not care about actually how is this thing going to be deployed and run and maintained and all yes. that? Obviously, this leads to loads of little components that are uh, uh, in isolation of each other that uh, have a dependency obviously, yeah? we need to do things together but they're all little isolated things we have a very high um, uh, ramp up yeah? to build something like that because we're looking at loads of loads of things that need to be separated and uh, communicate and messages that are flying around and. Uh, databases and tables and uh, teams that uh, who owns what and all that, right? So yeah, that was the question. We'll talk about it later. Coming back to the not perfect thing, again, accept that you never, you you're most likely will not get it right, not in the first time. And as you go along, you'll see what you know. You learn from your mistakes, and you you continuously have to. Uh, be pragmatic, yeah, and understand all your limitations, all your context, and do your best to deliver. Okay, so don't, you know, gold plating this is going to be extremely painful because as soon as you finish gold plating it, somebody will drop a, a, a little acid on, on top of that, yeah, and say, oh, but 
just uh, just one thing. I wanted this to do like that. And you go, oh, uh, uh. So, so this, as you said, times 500 is what we're going to end up with, yeah? Or times 50. This is the, the, the yellow service, the orange, the green service. These are the logical boundaries, not the actual components, okay? And each one of them, we probably have tens of components. It doesn't mean that they have to run in different processes. It doesn't mean they have, you know, you can put all this in a single monolith up and run it, yeah? There's nothing, you know, as long as you don't need to scale, there's nothing that makes it, that makes it not work. Only people, yeah? Only the fact that you need this piece of code, all the, this stuff needs to be managed by one team and deployed on this server, and this, this piece of code needs to be maintained by another team. If you put everything together in one process, in one uh, repository, in, you know, I don't know, um, you know, I've seen projects that have more than 200 developers, let's say, and uh, they're all trying to update the same repository, right? Do you like to do that? Yeah? You know, it's horrible. What do you do? You sit, you sit and wait till you get a window. You try and push. It fails. You get, get latest. You try and push again. Then what do you do? Force push, right? <laughs> I need to go home. And then everything blows up, right? So these things, of course, and I'm mentioning it later, that these things are considerations you need to really live with, yeah? But just as a simplified kind of diagram, that's what we're going to end up with, okay? And this is what our table's kind of going to look like, and uh, this is not big enough, is it? Anyway, I try to kind of see, to kind of illustrate that, you know, we have uh, some properties on those tables, some fields, that are only IDs, yeah? They're IDs that reference each other. You know, if I have a user account, the user account will have the authentication GUI of, of the user, and I'll have uh, something else. The same for, um, you know, the contact details. I have loads of IDs here. I only have the email as, as, a, as an actually a value type, yeah? But the rest is all references from other entities in my, uh, in my thing. And, as it, and I try to color it, you know, so all the purple stuff belongs together and all the green stuff belongs together, but there is only one owner of that color, okay? Does that make sense? Or so the customer account ID, it is owned by the account service or the account boundary, okay? And it's the only one that actually creates it. All the rest are reading it, okay? And notice that there's no foreign keys here, okay? So align that with those services, and this is gonna be, uh, I tried, by the way, and I will do it better next time, I tried to color the different uh, tables to kind of match them to the, <laughs> to the services, but, or to the boundaries, I guess. Uh, but basically, all the customer stuff, the customer contact stuff is going to be in one thing, and the login stuff, the authentication is going to be in one thing, and the payment stuff is going, also going to be probably in one boundary, okay? One thing that lies together. Does that make sense? Does that, any of you are, obviously you're doing microservices, you know this, right? You, you have this kind of fragmented, tables that have very little in in the matter of entity but they're yeah or you still do the microservices on top of a monolith anybody does here uh, microservices on top of a relational database yeah. yeah yeah okay that's the the three mistakes in uh, messaging and I, I've done it myself so I can't uh, you know I, I was the first one to do it <laughs> Oh, that was the first thing I did uh, with messaging, and that was like to build a whole messaging system, a whole beautifully architected uh, messaging system that uh, ran on top of a, of, a, of a relational database, right? Can you imagine how nice that was, yeah? That was fun. 
Why not the uh, event sourcing? What? Why not the uh, event sourcing? Just emit events and forget. Like, don't store this. We're not talking about the, the technique at the moment. This is about how you do, how you decompose stuff, yeah? Not, but, uh, yeah? There's all kind of ways to do it, yeah? But the point is that, you know, me, once you introduce coupling and messaging, you're back in square one. You just made yourself a huge system that's going to be slow because it has messaging in the middle, and it's going to become a big ball of mud, distributed, right? When something fails, you'll have to look in 500 servers to figure out which one failed. Instead of just going to the one server and going, oh, SQL went down, restart, end of story. You know, SQL struggling, I'll add another CPU, whatever. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> and coming back to your question earlier, you've thrown me around a little bit, I shouldn't be answering questions probably. Um, <laughs> Find the bounded context and work your, your way up. So instead of going from the database up, find the bound context, build your components, and work yourself up, your way up, and join the things. I'm not saying put the code together and all that. I'm just saying put the things that are in the same boundary together and associate them with each other, just logically, yeah, not physically. And that they would kind of become your service if you wish, okay? Now this is a bit orthogonal to microservices, right? You all agree? Disagree? Sorry, you can build your microservice around your domain. So you, you could, you yeah. Microservice that reflects your domain. Okay. So I think the lit, you know, I, uh, I'm not an expert of microservices. I'm not, uh, you know, the first one who did microservices. Uh, but I'd say that most microservice people are kind of taking a bunch of stuff and just putting them in, in, in a process, right? And making that a service and that is the end of the boundary, if you wish, yeah? And there comes the, then the question start about how, how do you process stuff, right? How do, you, how do you put everything together? How do you orchestrate it? Uh, who owns the UI? All those things, yeah? Sound familiar? Awesome. So, I'm borrowing from service-oriented architect architecture, and I think that you know it's good to learn from everyone. Yeah. So my experience comes from service-oriented architecture, and the service boundary or the grouping or the bounded context uh, service. Co what does uh, Evans call it? I forgot. Service. There, there. He calls this something. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the name, but it is the kind of the service context, if you wish, or a, it's, it's bigger than the bounded context, basically, okay? So if you find that service boundary, it's easier to then go and say, all these things belong together logically. Don't put, you know, if you need to do um, a something to the user when you're doing a something to the financial thing, don't do it there. Send a message over to the financial thing and he'll do it. That's like an application service. Most you have your application service which is doing context. Yeah, but the idea is just to, to keep it logically and not physically. That's that's the hardest thing because when we talk about services, it's an overloaded thing, right? What is a service? Calculator? A Windows service? A web service? Yeah, all of the above. All of the above? Yeah, a washing machine? Yeah, yeah to me, it's Essentially, service, yeah. A service is a piece of code that doesn't fit into an entity. But that's where, you know, so that, that's, that's, uh, but that's good. That's, uh, that's the right, so if you, if you take a couple of bounded contexts and say all of them belong together and they are, they couldn't be decoupled, yeah? It makes no sense to, to take those bounded contexts and say, oh, this one's going to run over there, this one's going to run over there, and I'm going to have an overhead of chitty chatty things and instead of just them being together and being close to each other and kind of knowing, you know, they're, they're friends, they're not enemies, yeah? But they know each other, they're the same boundary, they're in the same courtyard, they play together, yeah? They play nicely together. And instead of just going like, no, we have to cut everything, and cut, 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 and then you end up with loads of little things 
that mean nothing and, and they're all over the shop and you try to figure out how to orchestrate all that. Yeah? So that's what I'm trying to kind of push for. So outside the boundary, you're going to have loose coupling and I'm referring to messaging and stuff like that here. Yeah, okay, so outside the boundary of, this, of the, the service or the, 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 the group of bounded contacts, you're going to have loose coupling, which means that you don't expect any kind of RPC. You don't expect for, change, for state changing operation, we're not doing request response, okay? We're not allowed to do request response because that means that you're trying to do something to someone else, right? And that breaks the whole idea of disciplining stuff, right? Inside the boundary, <coughs> tight coupling is not a problem, yeah? So inside the boundary, if you're doing five things in a procedural manner, it's totally fine, there's nothing wrong with that, because you expect this kind of behavior, right? Obviously, you have to be aware of not growing that bounded context to be a whole application, right? So, you know, we have to kind of... Uh, and another one is probably the respect the single da data ownership, yeah? So if there is a user table in my you know, this uh, login table, authentication table in my, um, in my domain, in my system, there's only one component, logical, I'm not saying if you scale it out and there's 10,000 of them, but one logical component that can update this table. All the rest can read, you know, whether it's from its table, now that's a whole different argument, or from a view model, or from a, um, a can read from a cache, or have a copy of the data, it doesn't matter, but they're not allowed, all the other, all the rest of the components in the system are not allowed to modify this data. It's like an aggregate route. Is there exactly, bounded content, yeah. yeah. Sorry, uh, I didn't mention aggregate route. That's a good point, because that's part of the, the idea here, okay? So, only one thing in the system owns this one piece of data, and it's really, really important, because, again, once you have multiple components trying to access, multiple bounded contacts trying to access the same piece of data, what happens? Race conditions. Race conditions, we're going to oh, be, you know, ability. one. Yeah, yeah and, and back to coupling, right? We, back to the thing that we have like two things trying to access the same thing, one in one context and another in another context. Remember the context thing? And now they're both trying to access the same thing, but for two different reasons. One is trying to update the user because it's trying to update the address, and the other one is trying to add the finan the finan some financial details, right? And so if they're both... Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So all communication goes through that route, basically. If yes. You have for not communicate. So again, we need to be really careful about the definition here because the important thing is the up is the state change. Okay. Okay. All of that. So if you have an aggregate route that has multiple uh, aggregates inside it, other entities, if you're going to update that small entity over here, you have to go, you have to sort of pass the aggregate route entity with, say it's a, say it's a site with a list of site users. You want to update one site user, you push the site up with, and with the site users list one added to it. Yeah. If, if the, yeah, but again, you're implying a little bit that there is a, like a dependency chain in the database and all that. Yeah, I don't, that's, that's I don't agree to that. So I didn't say that, okay? Yeah. That it's the bounded context. It's this thing that needs to work all together, okay? It could be a bounded context by process, okay? So I have, I have to, as you said, uh, update the site, you know, create a record, update the site, and do another thing, yeah? And all these things have to happen in one, one go, right? So they have to belong together, okay? And then, when they belong together, whether you do DDD style aggregate routes, dependency graphs and all that, that's your problem. <laughs> I wouldn't do it because then, you know, those dependency graphs are, are uh, tightly coupled in such way that you almost, you know, it's a lot harder to change. But that's different, a whole, you know, if, if you put all this bounded context in one component, and you make sure that the process updates it in a, a transactional way, okay? So not acid transaction, but that all of these uh, actions happen, 
and then you're done, right? And you know when your state is done, then you're good, right? Whether it's a single thread or multi-threads or single message, multiple messages, doesn't really. But the important thing, I think you got the important thing, yeah? The important thing is that you don't try to extract this to other things and that there's only you know one way in, yeah? One, 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 door in. one, one door thing in. That, that is responsible for that state change. Because otherwise you lose, once you lose that responsibility, everything's out the window, right? Because uh, if you can do it, I can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. You can do it, you can do it. And then we all do it together, different contexts, and we're all trying to do different things on the same thing, right? Uh, now, if it's all, you could get away with it probably if uh, every context has a different role, so it's a diff you know, it's not the same user, then maybe you can get, get away with it. But still, logically, once things change, you're going to break something, yeah? <coughs> remember, just, w just one second, remember that this is about data rights, okay? This is about state changes. The reads are a totally different story, okay? Uh, re 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 regarding uh, data rights, uh, I just want to confirm for the, for, for the first point because it's, it's very important. Uh, if updating yourself, you, you need to update some, some, something out of the context, you're, you're saying uh, never, ne 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 never do a blocking uh, call, uh, tr tr throw a message instead. Exactly. Okay. So in between your components, in between your running processes actually, things that don't belong in the same dom app domain, you're going to send a message. You're not going to be calling another app domain. You're not going to call an API. Not going to. Now this, again, in the context of single responsibility in data in the domain. If you're talking about uh, accessing a web service in order to get uh, some, to make a payment, that's a totally different story. It's a technical component. It's outside the boundary of that, the, the logical boundary thing and we, <coughs> You know, we need to look at that totally different, okay? <coughs> so now, this is where everything starts to be really fun, right? We're now, we have this distributed thing, and it's uh, running on three processes, okay? Five processes, sorry. I've dropped all the zeros in order to make it simple. And um, we're trying to build all those composition points on top of it, right? And now things are getting really, really shitty because we have a UI and the UI, uh, most of the UIs, sorry, are, uh, are composites, right? There's a little bit of shipping, there's a little bit of sales, a little bit of marketing, a little bit of branding, there's a little bit of uh, the user data, there's a little bit, yeah? Make sense? Mm -hmm. And we need to kind of compose all this sea of stuff onto the UI in the right order and, and make sure that everything's aligned and all that. And that's where things get really, really tricky. Um, and I don't have good news, like I don't have like jack in the hat solution for, uh, for that, that thing. But <coughs> I, uh, you, you, could, you have to acknowledge that it is a composition, that's the first step, right? So don't think of the UI as a, as a monolith, right? It's not a one view that's going to do everything for you. And the other thing is that composition means that you need to pick up stuff that you logically know what each UI element belongs to. Logically, okay? So if I have a login thing, that logically belongs to my authentication service, right? Logically. It runs on a different process, it's on the other side of the world, it's distributed on uh, hundreds of servers, right? It's nothing to do with my, it doesn't have any direct connection to my, uh, physically, to my uh, authentication service, right? It only is logically that, that little bit. Obviously, in the UI, you'll have to publish events, right? So you're all J, J, Java something, JavaScript something, no? Angular, Angular, uh, yeah, yeah. Amber. Amber. Anybody here, like me, that doesn't know all those uh, those frameworks? 
the choice there for the book, you know. <laughs> so, obviously, all those tools and the uh, new frameworks and the old frameworks all do those kind of things. Yeah, you, in Angular, you can uh, you create your own little bus in the back in the front end and get events back and forth be between the uh, front end and back end. And obviously, to get a good UI composition, most of the time, what you're going to do? Are you excited? <laughs> <laughs> he knows. <laughs> Most of the time you're going to read, right? Yeah. Most of the time you're going to display data. And then from time to time you're going to submit data. So the reading thing comes back to or goes into the whole read model idea and getting data out there, aggregating it or slicing and dicing it, making it available so that cons consumers and, compos and composition clients, like an API, or UI, or maybe um, um, your uh, integration endpoints, yeah? So customers that want to use you as a white label or whatever, uh, they all use those, they need data composition, right? They need to, to be able to go, give me the list of all my users, you know, I want to check uh, uh, before I, send a message to create a user, to create a new login, I want to check that this user doesn't exist in the database, right? So I have two options. Anybody care to do the first one? Two is not. 20 options. But two styles. The create, the create user checks for the... For so the UI will call the, the, endpoint. the endpoint, yeah? And will... Refresh. Join. Okay, so the UI is going to call the, the service that owns the user table, right? Do a request to the, that thing, get back the list of users, right? Yeah, Just it's fair. It's, it's doable, right? It's... Uh, yeah. And do the validation and all that, right? And then when he's happy that there's no user like that, he'd send a message, right? What's wrong with that picture? You're doing request response from the UI to a backend service that lies somewhere in the ether, one of 500 or one of 1,000 or one of 50, yeah? And now your admin just moved the service, right? And changed the, the database to be on that over there instead of there. Is that going to be a problem? Yeah, potentially, yeah. Yeah? Is that like, it's like crossing loads of networks and loads of load balancers and stuff in order to get the data that's technically yours to read, right? So in that, that kind of scenario, a better and more proactive kind of way to deal with it would be to create a view model or a read view model or some cache, if you want. I think cache is the closest thing to people get it a lot better than the, the concept of view models. But it's this thing that when I create a user, I'm going to write to it or I'm going to send a message to get somebody to write to it or somebody is going to, you know, some component is going to listen to events that come out of my, uh, my, my component that does the work, right? And knows for sure that from a business perspective, this is done. This user is now authenticated, yeah, or being registered. And I'm going to write to this view model. And this view model is, could be a cache, a Radis thing, uh, whatever you want. This thing distributed all over the world. And all I need to do as a client is go and say, oh, is this user, you know, did this, do I have this user? Yeah or nay? If it's okay, I'm going to chance it. I'm going to chance it with pretty good, you know, I know that I'm pretty sure that there's no user like that in the system and I'll send a message over to the backend. To, um, to to submit that, that thing. Does that make sense? Can I just clarify that? So you're sort of suggesting that the view models are a stage, client-side stage, so you go to your well, client -side Yeah, state they're kind of shared state, if you wish, not client-side. Okay, yeah. so shared state. And that sits in front of the back end, so you go to the shared state first before you then go to the, to the back end. Well, you don't go to the back end because well, again, what we're talking about is like 
things that are done synchronously using messaging. So there's no. Okay, so at some stage you will call an API syncs up with this shared state by caution, perhaps, or by. It really just read, yeah, that. yeah. You yeah, so it's kind of like it sits there in between. Like it's like an in-between thing, yeah. but I'd like to see it more as a, this is like the view of the system for the rest of the world, yeah? And even not the rest of the world, it's even for the system itself. But it's the, it's the real state. In the old days, we had OLTP, right? And we had the, the reporting database. Anybody did build systems like that? Yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we did, but but it's it was actually very good practice because the business never asked to go into our transactional database and and poke around and and, and ask for all kind of weird stuff or run queries that you know the sales guys were trying to figure out or the uh, the analyst the, ana the an ana ana analysts were trying to run all kind of really crazy queries on top of our tra transaction database and lock tables and rows and all these things that wasn't a problem, right? We could uh, in in our reporting database they could do whatever they want. Yes, the data was stale, but who cares? Is it important? It's not. Okay, so view models are a little better than that because you actually push the the state that is logically transactional correct. Yeah. <clears throat> Because what happens in the queues and what happens in the temporary, you know, things in flight shouldn't be a real state. It's not real state. Like, any of you hook uh, into SQL uh, logging thing to do stuff? The SQL log? No? You did. <laughs> what do you mean, Sean? You know, SQL, when it writes transactions, yeah, yeah. it's called the, the transaction log, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this thing, you can hook up into it yeah. and get the transaction, that's, right? That's yeah. how you used to have active, active, or active passive. Yeah, active, okay, passive, we have backups, we, you can do all kind of funky stuff, right? But you won't do it in a tra traditional really system, works. right? Not, not for state to get real state, right? Would you? Uh, in the old <laughs> days, <laughs> Do a differential way too, or they? Just give it to Cassandra. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, as developers, we can do everything, right? <laughs> That's our job. We can hack it away. But the the, the problem of, of reading from the transactional log is that you are reading state in in transit, right? You are reading things. It hasn't really got to the disk yet, right? It hasn't. This is like this is what SQL pushes downstream to get to the disk, right? What is really, really, really the state is what's on the disk. Do we agree? Or is it what's on the... I'm not sure if that's persistence. The thing that goes on to the disk is just persistence. But this, that's, but that's this is the real state. state. Because if the disk, state. if the thread <laughs> dies... If you're, in a, if you're in a system that has latency, yeah. your state is what's in front of the user. Or what, what Correct. Correct. Which is not necessarily what's on the disk. Mm. Exactly. But this, is, but this is the discrepancy between what we, how we interpret it, and how we actually do it, right? Because if we show the user that this balance is like a thousand euros, and in the bank right now there's something running in the background that's three weeks old that just took 500 off his account, it is actually minus 400, and he's taken another 100 out because he thought he has a hundred thousand in, or, yeah, do the maths better than me, <laughs> then it's like, then we are actually cheating the user, right? Well, but we are transactionally correct, because I read, I showed you exactly what I read from the disk right now. So this is the, the whole, you know, what we're getting into the whole, like, uh, eventual consistency thing and all that. So, but it is important to acknowledge it and to put the things together in order to show a state that is acceptable for you, for your business, you know? So if you're a real-time, uh, if you're dealing with